Well, here we are with a very special offering for you today on Korea Now. We have an official who we've spoken about on many times, maybe even speculated about what was in her mind. But now we can ask Kang kyung hwa herself, the foreign minister of South Korea. Thank you so much for taking the time. Happy to be here. And in the last few days, one of the big talking points has been the uh, trip of Kim Yong-chol, Pyongyang's mm -hmm. top nuclear negotiator mm -hmm. to the United States. And mm -hmm. that sparked a lot of hope that we will indeed see that second summit between North Korean chairman mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un and mm -hmm. US President Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, what's your broad forecast for that summit? Well, I think the visibility for a second US-North Korea summit has uh, been certainly enhanced um, by the latest developments. Um, I think it will be, if it happens, a, a very important milestone that further builds upon the developments of last year. Um, it was a year where we were able to make a huge switch from a situation of confrontation and rising tension to one of dialogue and, and peaceful resolution. Um, with a second U.S.-North Korea summit, um, we will be able to take very concrete strides along that road toward uh, nuclear denucle um, complete denuclearization and, and building lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula um, that we have just opened. And what kind of agreement can we expect, though, mm -hmm. from this second summit, pre presuming it is going to happen? Mm -hmm. Well, the first summit was, uh, was historic in itself, and the outcome of it was a very broad framework of, of of shared goals, um, one being, you know, leaving behind hostilities and, and, and working towards better relationship between the U.S. and North Korea. The second being an agreement to work towards lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the third being the North Korean leader's reiteration of his commitment to complete denuclearization. And, and the chapeau that indicated the U.S. willingness to provide security guarantees. So the the goalposts are there, and, and so the second summit has now to produce concrete agreement towards those goalposts. I mean, it did feel a bit like the goalposts were moving when North Korea started saying, well, denuclearization means um, any kind of American nuclear threat in this region. Mm -hmm. in North Korea does its messaging in different ways. Um, this is not out of their usual way of... Um, of, of uh, messaging to the outside world. Um, but I think what comes clearly through is, is the commitment to mm -hmm. complete denuclearization and to do it with the United States in response, uh, expecting some concrete uh, corresponding measures from the United States. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the task at hand between the two sides. What steps North Korea uh, is willing to take on the denuclearization track and what steps the United States is, is uh, ready to provide in terms of corresponding measures. So that's, that ha that's, the, that's the basic uh, elements of the, the discussions. Of course, the denuclearization issue is not just a U.S. issue. It's, uh, first of all, it's our issue. It's, it's our security. We, are, we live in this, uh, in this region. It's a global uh, goal as well. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, goal that's stated in, in a series of Security Council resolutions. Um, so the U.S., in fact, is, is there on behalf of the global community um, uh, negotiating with North Korea. You talked about corresponding measures. One thing we know North Korea would like very much, and I think many South Koreans would like as well, is an end of war declaration. Mm -hmm. What kind of steps could we expect from North Korea in return? Mm -hmm. What would those steps look like? Mm -hmm. This was um, something that we promoted and we continue to promote as a, um, as a political declaration that indicates clearly before the world to, you know, end to hostile intentions and the start of uh, a, a process toward a peace treaty to replace the armistice treaty, and that we will do this in good faith. So I think the nature of that declaration is something that will also further encourage the denuclearization process along. We still think it's a very good uh, step 
uh, for all concerned to take. What North Korea can then offer in return is, you know, I, I would shy away from giving specifics to that because that very much depends on, on the, at the table between the United States and North Korea. But, uh, you know, the, the denuclearization uh, challenge is a, is a process, it's a goal, and there are many things that need to happen in that process, not necessarily sequentially, uh, but the sequencing, uh, how, what, how to match denuclearization steps to corresponding measures is, we think, should be done in a way that has all the elements on the table, with a comprehensive agreement, then step-by-step -step implementation of, of those uh, agreements. Um, many freer th sort of speakers can say that, you know, it, w it was perhaps unrealistic of the US to come out straight with CVID at the mm -hmm. bat and, and say, we need to bring about complete denuclearization, we need to do it irreversibly, we need to verify this. Um, we then saw the softening of the rhetoric, uh, in some people's opinion, to FFVD. There is speculation within the South Korean media that we're seeing the US s sort of considering disarmament. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually, uh, there is genuine concern among conservatives here in South Korea that the US might, um, might not quite support them as much as they were hoping. Is it just natural worries because there's been this deadlock for so long? Or do you think the US is considering some sort of compromise? I think that the, our goal, a shared goal between the U.S. and South Korea, and in fact the entire global community, is clear. There is no shifting, not a bit, about what the goal is. It is complete denuclearization. It is the goal of the Security Council that has the primary responsibility for the peace and security globally. So, I, you know, we t press have has a tendency to zero in on specific statements and to read policy changes in those statements. I think that's excessive. Uh, in all of my discussions with uh, my Pompeo, uh, in all of our coordination and consultations at all levels, uh, there is no change, no shifting in what the goal is. We have our clear view on the goal, uh, but we know that it is not an easy process. Uh, I always say, take a deep breath, because it is going to take a lot of patience and, and time. Uh, but the, the sh there has not been a shift uh, in, in the policy goal. What do you think is behind the U.S. decision to open up to humanitarian aid to North Korea? I don't, um, you know, it's, it's, it's significant. I think it's particularly welcomed by humanitarian agencies. Uh, but it's more of a procedural easing of of humanitarian agencies to travel to and do their work in the North Korea, rather than a fundamental shift in from no to yes. But in the, it is a positive signal, um, and uh, you know we've always argued that humanitarian assistance has to be separately considered. Now the real day politics makes that uh, a little, little uh, less so clear. But our policy has always been that this is separate. This is this has to be pursued in its own worth, and and so we welcome it. Are we reaching that point where there has to be some sort of action on sanctions to start saving lives in North Korea, rather than you know just being patient politically? Mm -hmm. The Council sanctions make clear exemptions for humanitarian assistance. So we can do that without sanctions relief. Um, the sanctions are in place because of North Korea's nuclear and missiles development. So sanctions relief is dependent upon North Korea's actions on its nuclear and missiles development. That I think is, is very clear and so as long as uh, we don't see visible action as long as we are assured that North Korea is well on its way to um, complete denuclearization, we know the sanctions will have to be faithfully implemented. I was um, in Guangdong when President Trump came to visit, and that, I mean the mood was pretty electric. There were protesters, there were supporters. It was certainly dynamic. I just can't even imagine how that would be ramped up if we saw Chairman Kim driving through Guangdong mm -hmm. for a meeting with President Moon Jae-in. I mean, from a security point of view alone, that's a massive headache. But um, 
if that were to happen, can you see it happening within this year? And, and how meaningful would that be? We certainly hope to see it happening uh, sooner rather than later. Yes, uh, there will be these challenges. We are a vibrant, uh, vibrant democracy with very different views. Uh, uh, a lot, many civil society groups with different views, um, and and that's that's who we are. And I think we'll have to manage that situation. Uh, but if it happens, it will be of a huge historical significance. The thing is, if it happens, it will be an indication things will have been going very well up until that point, presumably, um, as you know, his failure to come obviously in 2018 was mm -hmm. very much in line with the deadlock with US talks. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger instead, though, that we'll see Chairman Kim go down this new way that he talked about in that New Year speech? Mm -hmm. But I think the new way, yes, I think, you know, it's both the domestic and the uh, the uh, international audience intended there. You know, I think that was uh, uh, you know, while you know shoring up the North Korean position before coming back to the table with the United States. You know, but also to the to the uh, to the domestic audience. And so, you know, every line of what the chairman says is is picked and meticulously analyzed and, and we, we of course are I mean, North Korea experts are seeing trying to see what that means but in, at the end you have to see that in the larger context of the developments um, since then since then as you we see there is re-engagement at the high level and I, as I said the visibility has now been very much enhanced because of the recent developments. The uh, Defence Ministry's white paper had reclassified North Korea's state as enemy. Is that peace process in danger? The oh, South-North peace process? Well, the, particularly President Moon's mm -hmm. peace process. I think, you know, the peace process has, is not just South-North process. It's a, basically, if, if even just technically, it's, a, it's at least a three-way or a four-way process uh, if we were to build, you know, something that replaces the armistice. The, the armistice is what defines relations for the past 65 years, and that has to be replaced by something that involves all the signatories to the armistice. So formal peace is beyond, is more than just South and North Korea. Uh, but on the South-North Korea track, uh, through these three summit meetings, numerous follow-up meetings, the dialogue is very active on, on you know, we've had an, a major agreement on the military front that uh, has resulted in steps that have hugely reduced the possibility of something happening on the DMZ that could lead to something much bigger. And so these confidence building measures on the military side. Having grown up in this part of the world with this, you know, this fear that something could happen, that is huge. And then there's, we've had a, we've had a survey of the, the rails. Um, so, you know, there's active happenings between South and North Korea, um, but again, all within and uh, the in the in keeping with and adhering to the global sanctions regime. So, yes, it's not full fledged, but within that confines, uh, there are lots of things happening. And so, I think. The dynamics is, is active enough and strong enough so that it will continue. Well, I've seen the tensions go around in this cycle. I'm sure fear mm -hmm. what happens when we return, if we return to mm -hmm. tensions. What do you see the situation looking at a year from now, for example? Do you have that contingency in your mind? Well, I don't want to speak in hypotheticals. I can always hope and, and draw a beautiful picture. But definitely what we aim to do is real significant and sure strides on the denuclearization track. Uh, and uh, as you know, the sanctions very much depend on denuclearization. But if we get significant tracks there, um, it, I think that then further expands the horizons for a south-north um, cooperation. Um, and you, the one thing that's not often talked about is the North Korean leader's repeated commitment to de delivering economic development for the country. And he knows clearly that he cannot deliver that under the sanctions regime. 
and for the sanctions regime to be lifted, he needs to deliver on the denuclearization track. I think we just need to reflect a little bit on, a, on another near neighbor, and that's Japan. Mm -hmm. And it's another big part of your job as foreign minister to handle this mm -hmm. very di difficult diplomatic relationship. Mm -hmm. This pattern has now been in place for years, and we have these elderly victims of colonial era abuses. Mm -hmm. What is your message to the Japanese government and to anyone who might be particularly interested in this issue right now, as time is very much running out? Mm -hmm. uh, and in these matters, you do have to take a victim-centered approach. What do they think? How can, how can their, their sense of injustice be alleviated? You know, but so there are issues of the past that, that have not been fully resolved. We, know we will have to manage that. And we, we want to do it with cool, you know, as at professional diplomats. Um, uh, with, uh, with measured rhetoric, uh, measured uh, uh, discussions. We also want to move along and, and then expand our ties on other fronts, so economic collaboration. Our business ties are huge, our people to people and, and cultural ties. So we, we very much want to take a two-track approach, you know, deal with the difficult issues of the past as they are, but our focus on the victims, but also, you know, do things on these many other tracks that the two countries can do to benefit each other. So that's our, the basic approach of my, my government. I, I will not comment on the conduct of uh, our counterparts, but uh, I think in the end, you know, I think the, 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 there are facts about the past. Uh, there is a huge sense of injustice uh, by the victims of the past, and you cannot ignore that. Well, thank you so much. I don't know whether your legacy will be North Korea related, Japan related, or both, but we wish you all the best with thank both you. of those. Foreign Minister Kang Kang Thank Kyung you Hwa. very much. Thank, thank you. you for joining thank us you. on the Korea Now. Thank you. Congratulations, Korea Now, on breaking 10,000 in subscription in three months of operation. I wish you growth in leaps and bounds so that you become a trusted channel of information about happenings here in Korea to the global audience.